if if Job is in the video, then people will watch it. Yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's good, Job. I've noticed that in the comments that they're like, ah, this guy should come back. That's time. right. That's right. Everybody yeah. wants to see Job back. <laughs> you you oh, yeah. two should be talking. I'm I'm gonna mute myself and listen. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to mute yourself. Just, please don't. Yeah. Please don't. I mean, I, I, I've watched you. You've got yeah. this tremendous sense of humor. I don't yeah. know how you do it, but it, but you should be in there. Yeah, we'll it's at least have to put him in the thumbnail so that he attracts people. But uh, yes, also part of the discussion would be nice. <laughs> well, it's it's a shame I wasn't born a hundred years earlier because then I would speak Dutch, but yeah. I don't. And so. Well, I suppose it's also nice for your viewers that, that we're speaking in English. I suppose. I, I am yeah. astounded at how how good the English is of the Dutch. I mean, is the Dutch language going to disappear? I mean, your English is just flawless. We lack patriotism, maybe. <laughs> I think that's it. But, um, okay, so so we won't have Job introduce himself because he needs no introduction. But I, how about you two? Uh, who goes first? Um, should I go first? Yes. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Aaron. In Dutch, we would say Aaron, but uh, for purposes of, of this conversation, I'll say Aaron. I am uh, 22 years old. I'm currently uh, studying uh, philosophy. I'm in a research master right now. Um, so also from, I suppose, philosophical interests, I sort of got back at religion. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm in a conversation with, <laughs> with, with, with both my dad and and you guys, which is just great. So it's uh, it's really interesting to see how sort of this has combined our interest into this conversation. So we'll see uh, what it what it brings today. I'm looking okay. forward to it. Where are you studying, Aaron? Uh, Utrecht. That's also where we met, met up with uh, with uh, Joop the other day. Yeah. Okay. So it's Very kind of cool. in the center of the Netherlands. I know that most Americans usually have the reference of Amsterdam, but then very few other. Uh, cities in the Netherlands, but Utrecht is fairly close to Amsterdam. It's, yeah, in American well, uh, distances at least, yeah. And if you grew up Yankee Dutch, you know that there's an important university there that's important for Dutch history, so. That's true, that's true, that's true. So th yeah, that much I know, I've never been to the yeah. Netherlands, but that much I know. Yeah, you're welcome to visit, obviously. The well, one, of these, one of these here. days I'll get there. Yeah. Mm, good. <laughs> one of these days. And your no. father. Yeah. Yeah, that's the old man then. Um, uh, so I'm 53. <laughs> you're, you're not older than me. <laughs> no, no, you're 57 or something? Uh, 56. 56. Okay. So, yeah, that's probably pretty accurate. So, um, yeah, what's, what's to say about me? Um, I'm the proud father of this, uh, this young uh, Aaron, and he sort of cooked up this, uh, this meeting. So I'm very grateful to him. I'm learning an awful lot these days. It's, uh, it's incredible what's, what's happening. So it, I, I really enjoy it. Um, what do I do? Um, I don't know. I did industrial engineering. So that made me an engineer. Then I went into finance and economics. And then I went to South Africa um, when Nelson Mandela was elected president. And um, came back, <clears throat> worked on public transport and then did my PhD in theology. Wow. Um, so it's a bit of a, a strange mix. Um, you always had time in, to have a kid along the way, obviously. Uh, not just yeah, one kid. Yeah. Not just one. Not just one. <laughs> How many? We have six. Oh, <laughs> more than me. <laughs> We're good Dutch reformed citizens, so we, 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 we plan on making something happen. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I guess we always wanted four and the last two don't know. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. And you've got the, you've got the obligatory books behind you. That's, yeah, I uh, saw you. You had all these scholars with their bookshelves. So I thought I need to set up with the bookshelves because you want to <laughs> zoom in later on and see what kind of stuff is in the bookshelf. I, I understand that. So I, I, I respect that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and and Job just has a kitchen for for cooking uh, protein. <laughs> we'll see if we can get him to talk. He's just going to shut up the whole time <laughs> and smile and laugh He's at us. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the time is yours. What what do you guys want to talk about? Aaron, you go. Should I go first? Yes, you should. Um, 
I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I kind of, so I know that my, my, I, I kind of want to talk about my, my dad stuff actually, because that's why I also, I'm interested in, um, combining all these people into one conversation, I suppose, uh, for uh, those who don't know it, my dad is currently working on a book and he is really, uh, interested in finding sort of an audience that sort of would uh, fit the message of that book, but he doesn't quite know which audience that would be so obviously he uh tried um he tried to find a possible a possible audience for it so uh, i got a copy of the book and i made it like i think a quarter through it not that i wasn't motivated to do more i just didn't have the time sadly but it did sort of made me think like yeah who is this actually for um in the meantime my dad must have been i think both both um frustrated as well as enthused by the fact that I got so enthusiastic by this non-theologian Jordan Peterson like what is going on why is he interested in this psychologist interpretation of the bible whereas I'm a, the a theologian and I know much more um it's probably not the case my uh, he wouldn't be the something. only theologian to think those thoughts <laughs> no exactly so that's good or preacher um, yeah no true but then again um, I know that obviously you are uh, someone who is also a, a theologian, a pastor, but you're also interested in Peterson's work. And then you've also reached quite uh, a nice audience with that. And you're talking to many young people about this. So I was thinking like maybe there could be a potential overlap between your audience and a potential audience for my dad. So that's something that I want to get into today. And uh, for that, we'll probably need to discuss some of my uh, dad's theological <laughs> views uh, on uh, certain topics, but yeah. Okay, well, all these, you know, I, I've, one of the things that I've learned via YouTube is that I, I, think a lot of, I think a lot of scholars and academicians are really frustrated because they have all these ideas and they're, they're just, that these ideas have set their world ablaze and, and, <laughs> and nothing's taking. And then Jordan Peterson comes along and whoosh. Yeah. And it's like, why can't that happen to me? <laughs> exactly. Well, so, I also like, we also figured out that probably in my, um, I think that uh, <coughs> Jordan Peterson likes the polemic nature sort of sometimes. Yeah. Although like, obviously it has been pointed out that he is really devastated after, after those interviews. But at yep. the same time, he um, he also does let those things get on his nerve quite a bit and then uh, respond to them in quite a strong sense and uh, also a provocative sense. And I don't think, I don't know, I think uh, maybe both you and, and my dad and maybe Job as well are just too Christian for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they're just like, I don't know, they just want, uh, they have a bit of, um, uh, I suppose, the, the temperament doesn't suit that. Quite as well. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Well, let's well let's hear about the book then. So it's interesting that your son had these ideas about the book. So uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's hear about it. What what well, what caused this book and what's it about? Okay. Let's first say that Aaron is far more interesting to your audience than I am. So let's. But I can learn a lot. So that's, well, that's, we'll, we'll we'll let the audience decide that. Yeah. So okay. So that's one part of the story. But the other part of the story is um, I think it's actually quite tough now to um, to see my kids struggling with something like a Christianity as a stigma now. So it almost seems like you have to be ashamed if you say you're from a Christian family. Um, and some of them basically tell me, I don't did at one point, uh, I'm an atheist now, quite proudly. Or, or, not, anymore, say, not anymore, not anymore. I overheard him say that. It's, it's yeah. more like he was in the canoe, it, it, we've got a river at the back uh, of the house, and he was coming with a friend in the canoe, and I was sitting there uh, where the canoes normally land, and uh, I, he came there, and he, said, and he said to his friend, yeah, I guess I'm an atheist by now. <laughs> so, uh, 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 <laughs> what's going on? But he's not the only one. So it's pretty, uh, that's pretty impressive to see how people, you, you, so you can study all your life, and you can do all this stuff where you think you're, trying to be a reasonable, good dad. And um, it's gone, blown in the wind. So I, I don't know how, how you do it with your kids, uh, Paul, but um, I think it's challenging. And then they come home with the best types of girlfriends, boyfriends, and it's absolutely wonderful. And none of them have been raised a Christian. Yeah. And they all have all these preconceptions about what being Christian is. Yeah. 
and nothing resonates with me. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I love Jesus because he says, uh, don't judge. And they all think that we are judges. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I feel so ashamed of that. So, um, so when we were are having our 25th marriage anniversary, we went to Portugal and um, I've got a knee problem. So I had to stay in the house sometimes when they went off the cliffs and go to the beaches and stuff like that. Um, and um, I said, I, sh I should probably write it down, even if just to exercise for myself, if I can have an honest conversation about uh, the creed, uh, the, the thing that actually was supposed to make us Christian. Um, and what we can say if we really do not assume that the other person is Christian. Um, and can we then still share what we find in it? What really brings anything of that to my life, to, to, to what I cher cher uh, cherish? So if, 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 if I walk off the cliff and they climb off the cliff, then at least they have something, I thought, to remember me by. Mm -hmm. But that's a bit overdramatic. Um, what it ended up being, I, I, I read Druerman, Eugene Druerman, the German uh, psychologist, uh, theologian, and I was... I, I was get a bit depressive about this is done wrong in the church and this is done wrong in the church. And I, I th that shouldn't be like that. So I was trying to find a voice that would honor the text that would sort of open up a conversation like difficult words like hell. I mean, you talked to Preston about hell a little bit last time around uh, your newest post. Um, uh, and, and of course it's beautiful to talk about what's in there because it, it, it illuminates so much if you want to go in there. But can you do it in a way that's respectful to Muslims, to non-believers, to Buddhists, what have you? So that is the exercise. And then I gave it to Aaron and he got to a quarter of it. So I decided, well, I'm probably not a good writer. That's the first <laughs> conclusion. And he said, yeah, but you have to be on YouTube. You can't do this writing. And I said, I'm not on any social media. So what are you trying to, to do here? And he said, go talk to these guys, watch their YouTube videos and, and see what you can do. So that's, that's where we come from. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Why did you start with the Apostles' Creed? I didn't. Um, I do a lot of stuff, but the Apostles' Creed was something like, if you need to explain it to, say, people who really ask you or your kids, why are you Christian? What does that mean? The thing that they will ha have understood is that that sort of confession uh, makes it a Christian or not. Right. And I think that's problematic, by the way. So it's, yes. it's not yeah. that, I, that I think that's a good thing, but I think that is the case. So unless we are able to really discuss honestly about virgin birth and, and, and the return of Jesus and all that stuff, in an honest way with, with people uh, and, and acknowledging what we know and what we don't know and whether or not it makes any sense to us, whether it's relevant to our life today, um, I, uh, I thought it was the hardest place to do it. So we should. So, so Aaron, tell me, um, now this, is, this, is a little, this is a little sensitive because, of course, he's your dad and you want to no, no, respect no. him and not hurt his feelings. But um, Inheritance, inheritance, careful. <laughs> Job speaks. It's already divided <laughs> by six. Job and his three <laughs> friends <laughs> here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Aaron, you, you had the, you had the, um, you had the, you had the intuition that just maybe explaining the, well, correct me if I'm wrong, that explaining the Christian faith in that way and, and for, wow, for a long time, this has sort of been the way to explain the Christian faith. You write a book and you approach it from, let's say, the Apostles' Creed, and mm -hmm. but, but you had, you kind of had an intuition that that might not get a lot of traction. Why not? Um, first of all, I, I think I should comment on the fact that my dad told me explicitly that it's something to sort of like meditate on. So he wanted me to only read four pages at a time. So uh, <laughs> mostly like at, at most four pages a day. So then you do that, but four pages is not a lot. So you don't really get involved in it. You do so somewhat, but you don't have time to meditate that much every day, especially if you're in college. So I did that and for like a few days and then you skip a day and then you skip two days and then eventually you skip three days. And I noticed like it probably would have been better for me to just read it start to finish in like, I suppose like two, three days. 
-hmm. So that's uh, just to let them know that it's no, uh, there's nothing wrong with this writing per se. I suppose there might be something wrong with the concept of um, meditating on these texts that um, it isn't clear from the start that you need to meditate on them if you can also, you know, meditate on the uh, mindfulness, which is completely uh, like a, a trend right now, obviously, um, which may be a bit more shallow in comparison to what my dad is working with. But at the same time, it seems to draw the attention of many uh, uh, young people. So I noticed that uh, then another thing that I noticed when watching uh, stuff from, for example, Peterson, but I'm also watching uh, John Verveke or uh, Jonathan Pajot, is that the the manner in which they uh, tend to talk about similar subjects, they do so without invoking um, certain buzzwords that are very necessary for Christians, but at the same time tend to alienate people that are not entirely sure yet about their Christianity. And those are words like faith and hope and love. And these are words that my dad rightfully uses a lot because they're very important words and i think that you use them a lot as well and i think that they're important but at the same time they seem to alienate people because they're like oh those are the christian values that i learned from nietzsche are i should despise so much um and precisely for that reason i think that this um manner of treating it either from a uh in symbolic language with hierarchy works for some people obviously less than what peterson does is from more of an evolutionary perspective i suppose or a psychological perspective or john verveke with his cognitive scientific perspective it seems that even though more and more people are drawn into the importance of um getting value back from religion they're still too um i wouldn't say brainwashed but they think that the scientific framework is too important to just uh, let go of and they want to justify their religious beliefs through that first and that is something that I couldn't find uh, in my father's work I suppose so that's something uh, that we could work on but at, at the same time you tend to you know there's a difference in explaining and explaining things away and that's I think something that my dad is also very careful with so it's a <laughs> dilemma uh, yeah. I think it's a bit of a bootstrapping problem as well uh, Monday, I was invited by an atheist friend of mine to go see Richard Dawkins' lecture. Um, so I went along, of course. Oh, <laughs> um, wh And what I noticed there was largely um, a pretty young audience. And uh, I, I did some writing about it on the Discord server, but one of the, uh, a couple of things stood out to me um, that Dawkins was very dismissive towards. Uh, the Christian faith, at least, like the Bible, he said, was written by Bronze Age camel herders with the less knowledge than a modern 11 year old. I'm thinking, have you read the Psalms? Have you read Ecclesiastes? Where do you get this from? But in the Q&A, there were questions like, well, how can we make society more secular? How can we make people, for lack of a better word, believe in science more? And there, there seem to be, you know, uh, Paul, you've called these people uh, slow utopians, I think. <laughs> uh, like they're slowly trying to, you know, if we can, and I belong to the same camp. I mean, I, I recognize the irony here. Uh, <laughs> but it's, if you are not ready to already look at it from a different viewpoint, that's just really difficult. Like, if I hadn't just bumped my head into Peterson, I wouldn't have looked at Paul's video and I wouldn't have seen the video where he analyzes the Sam Harris uh, uh, Peterson debate. With, and that's where Weinstein says, well, I understand the God that Peterson is describing. That was, that was such an important point because that showed, wait a second, this is about the relationship to reality that people have with, whatever they feel constitutes reality. And then you said, Bas, in our conversation, which I'm just still going on my head, I can't, I can't stop thinking about it, is that you said that the conversation that Moses has in Exodus, where God wants to start all over again, and Moses says, no, 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 no. You said that's a Socratic dialogue. 
And that, that blew my mind. I, that, that makes me see parts of the Old Testament differently. Yeah. Well, if, if that's a Socratic dialogue, now I understand better that the Old Testament is about the relation between God and, and humans and how you should, uh, as Peter would say, contend with reality. In, in, of course, a very different time and a very different world, but, well, that, that makes interpreting the Old Testament as a, as, as a very important collection of different things, just, just way more, uh, well, what is, what's the right word for this? I, I, would, I, I would wager that there would be a large part in Dawkins' audience where you could pull the same trick that Peterson said, would, would, would use and said, here's the Cain and Abel story. And here's why there's resentment in there. And here's why God doesn't kill Cain, but he marks him instead. He's saying, this is the mark of Cain where one human killed the other because they couldn't properly uh, uh, place themselves in relation to what life gave them and what being was. Because that, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think there's really something there. And I think, I mean, Bas, you wrote that book, right? About this psychological approach to Jesus? Um, the, to the historical Jesus. I, I want to read that. I think that, that the title sounds fascinating. And when you showed that book, I really thought it was interesting, but I didn't know it was your own book. Ah, so okay. it's also really expensive. In, in, uh, yeah, in I, 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 don't worry. Don't worry. I've got a copy here because <laughs> yeah. you end up with too many copies of your own. So that, that, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there, there is, there's a lot to be gained there. And I, I, in effect, we have in the Society of Biblical Literature, um, we have a group called Psychological Hermeneutics of Biblical Texts and Characters. I would love to have seen Jordan Peterson do his stuff there. Of course, mm. he's now far too big that, that there will not be a room that can contain that. But, mm. but that, well, and the, I must say the scholarly public might <laughs> need some convincing to give him a fair hearing. But uh, that's actually what we're doing there. <coughs> Psychological theories, looking at, te at texts, and then see what kind of understanding comes into existence once you, once you do that. And it's fascinating, and it's opening up all new possibilities so that that's one of the things that I was really happy to uh, to look at his uh, videos I think combined with what you've been working on regarding Psalm 42 43 uh, panic attacks the limbic system uh, pulling in uh, the Marshall's work similarly to how Peterson does in maps of meaning seriously there's I think there are loads of people who would be very interested in what you're trying to do Hmm. Maybe, maybe now we are losing the audience because we are throwing in too many different things. Uh, what do you say? Sorry about that. No, I don't think necessarily. And, and again, I think that was part of what Peterson demonstrated because, you know, when I found his videos, I found them engaging and hundreds of thousands, even millions of other people did too. And when I started putting my videos online, which are, one or two hours of me rambling in some ways and just dropping in other videos, people find that interesting enough to watch at least a few hundred or a couple thousand of them every now and then, you know? So, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't sell people out, but I, I think it's, I think it's helpful. As, as human beings, we can't help but follow certain, now I'm going to pull some James K. A. Smith here. And I'm going to pull some Rene Girard here. We, we can't help but imitate certain liturgies. And mm. some of these liturgies are enormously powerful and have been enormously helpful for many, many people throughout the ages. But we can't always just keep going back to that same bag of tricks. And that isn't to say anything about that bag of tricks. But when I was a college student, so, you know, I grew up with mom and dad and I was, you know, you know, all of us old guys on this call, we were young ones too. And that wasn't so long ago. It might be, you know, 40, you know, 30 years ago. But I went to, I grew up as a Christian and my father was a pastor and I went to Calvin College. And Calvin College at that point and still does sort of had the 
position where we're not going to make you go to chapel. We're not going to force you to believe. We're not really going to ram this stuff down your throats. So, you know, I'm at college and I decide, you know, do okay. So I was raised a Christian and all that stuff. I'm at a Christian college. That's fine. I don't have any problem with any of this, but do I believe any of this stuff? And so I started in a sense, reading the Bible for myself in a way that I never had before. Like I had to read for say, let's say school assignments or something like that. And I start reading the Bible. And one of the things I noticed right off the bat is that this, this evangelical way of approaching the Bible and all the language wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> and and the, neither is the Apostles' Creed. And that's interesting. And, and then I, I read Jesus and I was, you know, as a college student, I was quite frustrated by the kinds of things that Jesus seemed to pay his attention to, you know, healing on Sunday, wrangling over hand washing, you know, miracles Well, they're kind of cool. But of course, because of our cultural location, we're a little skeptical of them. And so then you go, you go on and you start reading, you know, Paul's letters and things like that. And that only gets worse because then they're talking about all kinds of other things. And maybe some little tidbits are recognizable to someone who's broadly evangelical. But so, so all of this is to say, it does not surprise me at all that in a time of rapid cultural change and dislocation, that, the, that many of the forms of generational indoctrination, and I'll use that word not in its pejorative sense, are failing us, partly because the church is now facing, the church, the church is in competition with a whole lot of other liturgies and enormously powerful tools that those liturgies employ. You know, 200, 300 years ago, the church didn't have to compete with Apple and, you know, any of the other a number of years ago, there was a really interesting piece done by Frontline called The Merchants of Cool, where it effectively demonstrated that, that the commercial world, for the most part, tries to capture the imagination of teenagers, and they bring that all the way down to little kids and breakfast cereals, in order to groom them for a world of consumption, which they are taught to believe will somehow satisfy them. Now, as with any idol or false belief, you can only play this game so long and it runs out of juice. Now, obviously, that argument is being made about Christianity that, oh, now we've all grown up and we all have science and we all know better than that. Well, I think the meaning crisis kind of slapped that idea in the face. And that's part of the reason that new atheists are in real trouble. But you know, there's two things that are true. One is that truth doesn't go anywhere. And the other is that we're perpetual idol makers. And so it's always a competition <clears throat> between the truth and our idols. And so that's the game that we're at. And so as a pastor, you know, I actually for a long time, I thought about doing some book writing. And just in terms of watching people, I looked around and thought, and I got a few pastor friends who have written books. Rob was on this. My friend Kevin Adams had written some books. And most of my pastor friends had said to me, you know, if I charged a per hour rate for writing my book, it would be way less than minimum wage. And I thought, okay, why am I going to write a book that no one will read? And what Aaron has noted is what a lot of publishers have noted. Um, if I wanted to write a book now, I could probably find a publisher who'd be willing to publish it because I have a YouTube channel. Yeah. Now, what sense does that make? But yeah. that's the truth. Oh, no. And it says that's a lot about this world. Well, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so the fact that the fact that there are, and, and this is one thing I've been, a del, I've been delighted to see with my channel, is, is that I'm delighted to give just a little bit of exposure that I can to many, many people doing really amazing things that no one will hear about because the public space is drowned out by the major marketing companies. And via social media, that's sort of starting to break up, but there are other dynamics that are at play. So 
So good for you, Aaron, in terms of poking your father and saying, hey, wake up. The world has yeah. changed. You just can't write a good book and have people read it, <laughs> even your own kid. So yeah. I told him to record an, an audiobook version of what he's writing right now. Then maybe people will uh, also pick it up. That's very true. You should definitely do an audio book. Arnold is one of these guys that, do, that, 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 that reads books by listening to, to double speed audio books. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, that's how I get my reading going. Otherwise, I'm just not a very active reader, sadly. But uh, yeah. Well, I yeah. do the same thing. And partly because, you know, I have to shower, I have to drive, I have to do dishes, I have to do all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And to sit there with a book requires a certain, a certain kind of time I don't have a lot of. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, for example, I am reading um, uh, one of the books that um, Peterson has also recommended. It's a book by Erich Neumann, The Origins and History of Consciousness. And that's a book that I really want to take the time for. So like I'll be spending like a few minutes from my day to actually read that. But then other than that, when I just want to like get a, um, I don't know, just read a book that is just important for me now, which I don't. I don't know, which I don't necessarily want to take the time to because it's not as comprehensive or not as um, difficult to understand as uh, a book like Neumann's. Then I can easily just, you know, listen to it while uh, cycling to class, essentially. Yeah. I, I, I think the question that we have to contend with is how will the Christian life be conceptualized and communicated? And yeah. that's, that's part of our struggle now. And I think... No one is smart enough to be able to sit down and predict what that will look like as the world turns, but we will probably figure it out together if we talk to each other and continue to write books and actually have people read them and do all the kinds of things that you guys are doing. So, yeah. so I, I want to go back to this little canoe incident. <laughs> and and talk about the atheist quote because again uh, the people themselves are the source of the information and that's key that's why on my channel i like talking to a lot of people because how am i going to learn if i don't hear what people think so so what do you want to know so tell me about it okay uh that's okay that's uh, sh should i yeah okay yeah um, <laughs> i was obviously ra raised uh, religiously um and I, I was actually, I, I was expected to go to church until my 18th birthday, but there were um, times when I, I mean, I, I was definitely still uh, a firm believer at the age of 18, but at the same time, when I would go to church, I would just secretly sit in the corner and put earphones in and listen to music when uh, no one was watching. So I was clearly not <laughs> motivated to go to church anymore, but I was expected to go, I suppose. Then I finally turned 18 and I no longer had to go to church, which was just great at that time. Um, and then um, slowly but steadily, I sort of got more in touch with more, I suppose, secular worldviews. I did um, still sort of retain my belief through uh, uh, a real appreciation for music. At first, I was a, a big uh, Switchwood fan. And then uh, and in, in recent years, I'm a big Sufjan Stevens fan, and both of those are very Christian uh, artists. Um, so even if I didn't really feel it myself, I could always feel it when sort of listening to their music or playing their music. So I didn't like quite uh, ever lose it. However, then when I went to uh, university, I think at the age of eight, uh, 19, probably, yeah, um, which was a liberal arts and, uh, and sciences colleges, college, um, I took my first philosophy class from a professor who is um, very much opposed to Christianity. Um, I won't mention his name, but uh, he very much made me question uh, what I used to believe before, even though I, I wasn't entirely sure if, it, if I found it convincing all the time. And also, as I pointed out, I wasn't even sure if I was a believer at that time, but the little belief that I had left, he seriously made me question. Um, and then also I started reading uh, philosophers like uh, like Nietzsche, um, who <laughs> was probably even more significant in um, allowing me to really criticize my uh, Christian beliefs. And um, that's how I sort of gave up on Christianity at the time. And then one final thing is that 
uh, I'm a huge fan of the show Rick and Morty, which um, obviously Rick and Morty should not be indicative of uh, any beliefs that I have about this world. But one very common thing that is uh, at the forefront of Rick and Morty is that life is meaningless. And therefore, it's sort of like this philosophy that uh, Albert Camus also really much embodies or embodied. And I did find it persuasive. So not necessarily that they said it, but also the fact that more people around me held this view that life was indeed meaningless. And But that's actually great because in meaningless life, you can create your own values, which was nice. But at the same time, I didn't, yeah, I don't know. I didn't, it didn't really fulfill me. So I was, I suppose I was indeed an atheist for some time, but uh, soon after I noticed that it it wasn't fulfilling. And then when I took uh, another class, which was specifically about philosophy in relation to um, the philosophical notions of God, I noticed that my professor had particular kinds of criticisms on uh, of the Bible, which I didn't think were very persuasive. So all of a sudden, even though I wasn't a believer, I was also like, yeah, but this is a weird type of criticism against it. So I started defending it again in a weird sense. Or when I did find something persuasive, I would go back to, back home and ask my dad, like, hey, so what do you think of this, you know? now maybe you'll become an atheist too. And then obviously my dad would be like, no, I'm a theologian. I've studied this. I know an explanation for this. I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Then I would go back to class and I would also have this rebuttal against my uh, professor and we would have many discussions. Um, But yeah. uh, And then whilst doing research for that course, I first stumbled upon Peterson's uh, videos, uh, which I'm very thankful for because that's also how I got to know Peterson mostly as, uh, well, someone who thinks about religion uh, mostly and to do with archetypes and all that, and not so much with politics, because if I had sort of encountered the political Peterson first, then chances are that I would have encountered a mischaracterization of him. So I'm very glad that I discovered him through that religious perspective. Um, And then all of a sudden, religion became a a whole lot more interesting again. Um, And I wouldn't say that I ever became... Uh, since then, I'm still not comfortable calling myself a Christian. I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable calling myself a Christian in my acts, you know, as Peterson also points out. But at the same time, when I look at it philosophically, when I try to think about arguments for and against the existence of God, I think of myself more as an agnostic thinker. But in most of my my feelings and my values and my acts, I remain a Christian. And that's also what I notice when I, you know, get into this stuff and look at your channel and look at Pajot's channel or Peterson's channel. So um, that's where I'm at right now. So I suppose maybe I was an atheist, but I was never, I was never like a true Nietzschean atheist who was comfortable with the fact that life is meaningless. Not for a long yeah. time. I have to say, Aaron, I have huge respect for the fact that you will debate your theologian dad on these things. <laughs> yeah, no, I also have much uh, a lot of respect for my younger self because my older self is not that stupid <laughs> <laughs> you learned something that the old man isn't quite as dumb as i thought he was <laughs> well let's 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 hear from the old man a little bit now now i don't see part of part of the well i guess it's probably different in every family but but often part of the weird thing about being a parent is is that your your kids and this is this is part of the mystery of life your and and the mystery of these kinds of things that you know i really love the way verveki manages some of this stuff and some of the language that he gives you know that your kids your kids probably have so much perspectival knowledge of you and and they see you with so much honesty because they've they've seen you at your best at your worst um, i mean all of that but one of the things they didn't see, and, and the one of the things they often didn't know so much is, is necessarily before they came onto the scene and had eyeballs to, to watch you from all their different developmental levels. So, so Bass, why don't, why don't you, um, even, even the little way that you told your story here, you didn't, you didn't at the age of 19 say, I want to be a theologian and I want to read the Bible. You studied engineering, you went to South Africa. Um, maybe, maybe you've been, a. you know, what, how, 
why do you take Christianity seriously? Is it was just that your your parents were Christians and the Netherlands used to be sort of really Christian and you were just indoctrinated into this and you don't have any idea why you believe this at all yourself? Or, or do you actually have ideas why you think it's true? Um, yeah, of course. I'm, uh, I probably think it's true because I'm raised in a Christian setting. Yeah, that, that's probably true. But my parents weren't that Christian. So they went to Canada, came back after some years to the Netherlands. Um, my father worked hard. I mean, they're mostly, uh, they were not like university people. So um, I didn't get the idea that studying theology would be something. Uh, and imagining myself being a minister, I thought that's impossible for me to do. Because I think it's a pretty impossible task that you guys have to uh, uh, fulfill. Um, but I may be wrong. So at least that, that, that's what, so I, I just went, go into business, do your work, work hard, etc., cetera. And, um, and that sort of, uh, was the idea, but at the age of 12, so that's quite early. Um, my sisters got into touch with, um, the navigators. You oh, must yeah. be familiar with them. Yeah. And, um, and the boyfriend of my eldest sister said, are oh, you going to go to heaven and stuff like that? And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and he was telling me the evangelical tale of uh, you have to convert and then et cetera. And then I said, okay, I'm, I'm happy to say yes to Jesus if that's what you want. Uh, because if that's in the Bible, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to oblige. But I can't see it as a conversion because when was I not a Christian? I remember as six years old, I used to read in bed because I would have... Uh, uh, well, I, I think I was a little older then, but still still in primary school. And I would read and the, the, the lights would be on, but my parents, um, well, the stairs would be creaking when, when they went up. So I could always switch off the lights, I thought, until my dad was in the garden and he saw me. And, and I was really afraid, you know, when he came up and I thought, well, I'm going to get a, um, a good old fashioned Dutch beating there. Um, so he came into the room and you can imagine then, of course, the light comes because I had switched off the light. So the, the light comes in, this door opens and there is this huge figure comes in and he is sitting next to me on the bed and he tells me all the stuff that, that he did uh, as a kid that were wrong. And he kissed me and he went da downstairs again. And I remember being a young kid to go on my knees and thank the Lord that he had given me a dad like that. Of course, if he never gave me a beating, I would not have been this relieved. Okay. But anyway, so I remember this, this thing talking to God and stuff. Uh, that was not a conversion. That was perhaps a coming of age that, that, that happens then. And when I turned uh, 17, I went to university. I wanted to know what's mine and what's not. So I decided not to go to church, not to do anything else, but read the Bible front to cover front to back, uh, all that kind of stuff, and really confront my own doubts. And um, yeah, I'm a doubter. I'm a serious, septic, doubter, scientific kind of guy. And yet, the other position would not have any less doubt attached to it. So then it all boiled down to the simple thing that I'm touched in my soul as a relational creature by it. So even though I cannot prove left, right, or center, I know that this David is a guy that I know, this Paul is a guy that I love, this, this Mary, this, this Jesus, this, all these figures are figures that populate my mind space. And I'm very, very happy with them, and, I'm, and, I, and I, can be, um, uh, I can be part of their world, and they're part of my world. So, so yes, I, I, that's what I liked about what Jordan Peterson was saying, that every generation has to make a new mix of what you get from the previous generation and, and the new world that you live in. And you have to do something with that. So, so that sort of forged itself uh, when I was uh, 18, 19 years old. So yeah, I didn't have an atheist period, although I'm beset with that. Yeah. You didn't have Rick and Morty as well, so that's uh, very simple. <laughs> uh, yes. And when I read uh, parts of the books that you recommended, like uh, uh, Zarathustra, um, uh, then I 
I really felt sorry for the guy. I said, yeah. you are beset with doubts as well. You don't feel comfortable at all. Um, and I also read uh, Ivan Yalom's psychological reading of Nietzsche wept. And, and, and he imagines Nietzsche coming to Freud. <laughs> so that's a beautiful fantasy that he, he's writing about. And, and, and that's really the difference between knowing facts and being in the world. And I know that Nietzsche is calling you out to, to, take, to take responsibility for yourself and to throw away all this bourgeois Christianity. And I, I respect that. Uh, but there's so much in there that's not bourgeois. Uh, and that is so real on a, a visceral level of being, level of, of, of um, there is this psychology um, guy, uh, Hjalmar Sundain, who wrote in the 60s about, uh, about the, the, the psychology of religion. And he talked about this, uh, he talks about um, how we communicate with God through the story material that we have accumulated over time. And, and that's really what's happened with me. So I'm, that, that's my world. And, and you know, I think part, you know, when I came across Peterson and I began to realize the effect he was having on people, I wanted to know why. Hmm. Because as a Christian minister, I'm far less effective than he is. And aren't I supposed to be trained and equipped to do this? And aren't I supposed to bear the truth in a way that he doesn't? And, and, and yet he seemed to be a far more effective evangelist than I could have ever hoped to be. So what's he doing? And this, especially from a guy who equivocates and, you know, shrugs and sputters when people ask him if he believes in God, which seems to be sort of table stakes for Christianity, at least, unless, of course, you're one of these highfalutin Dutch pastors who can go on the internet and say he's still a pastor and doesn't believe in God and that everybody listens to that and clicks on that because of that. How does that work? But, um, <laughs> but it, it's, you know, Peterson's, you know, one of, one of the things, so I, I'm continuing to uh, very badly make commentaries about Peterson's biblical series, which I think is important. And, and I'm still trying to, I still, I still work to figure out, okay, what's really going on with all of this stuff? And, and one of the things that I've come to is that, in fact, we, we actually are we actually are not terribly conscious of who and what we are down below the surface. And that, which means that the likes of Freud and Jung and, and a bunch of these mm -hmm. people had a point in that, you know, when I first started reading Jung, it was like, well, why do you pay so much attention to those doggone dreams? Who cares what you're dreaming about at night? I was like, well, yeah, it's a little crazy, but go, go ahead, Joe. You want to say something? Mm, what you said reminded me of, I think what makes Peterson interesting is that similar to what you're saying about who cares about dreams is that Peterson watches himself very, very carefully and he pays attention to that voice in his head as he's described it in Maps of Meaning. I, I think once you start to scrutinize yourself really closely, you start to notice you run on all sorts of weird assumptions. Like I have this weird, very weird experience now where I have a the same atheist friend who took me to Dawkins, I have discussions with him now where I find myself on the other side of the debate. Now, as I've always told you, Paul, this wasn't supposed to happen. I blame you, partially. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I keep saying, well, but you keep saying morality is subjective, but then you say that God is immoral. I mean, how, how are you doing these two things? And, and I mean, he's a great guy and we, we have very friendly discussions, but all I'm trying to do is like pay, pay attention because as soon as you start paying attention, you notice you run on all sorts of presumptions and, and uh, well, you have to. I'm not saying that's wrong, but the more attention you pay to it, the more you see, well, I mean, so there's this interesting thing. Sorry for hijacking the conversation. No, go ahead. That, that Dawkins said, he was talking about a uh, mathematician who was writing these great mathematic papers, beautiful formulas, great work, but in his private life, he believed that the universe was 6,000 years old. And Dawkins said, what a waste of a perfectly good brain. And I wanted to yell, value smuggling, <laughs> because, because he just showed his metaphysic. 
And his metaphysic is that truth is sacred. And truth is, is the life, and truth is the way. And like, oh, we're not so different. Be, and, but he doesn't look at that. Because he says, well, those 10% of scientists that say they're Christians, they're, they're probably just spiritual. They're not really Christians. And I'm thinking, well, I know that I know on Twitter, the Dutch guy, I don't know him personally, but the Dutch guy who was involved with that black hole photo that did the rounds recently, he's a Christian that influences his decisions. But Dawkins would say, no, no, that they're, they're likely just spiritual. There's no way that he can, he can see that those two things go together. But if you if he'd really pay it, would pay attention, he'd see he has a metaphysic. He Go actually ahead, he rolled he rolled his eyes at me at the book signing table when I said I'd convert it. <laughs> 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 Poor guy. Not even on your deathbed. Go go ahead, Aaron. You wanted to say something? Yeah, um, because it's both related to your much earlier point uh, about why is Peterson reaching this audience and why I am a pastor who is supposed to be much more equipped is not reaching this audience. But then also to Job's point that he is pointing out that if you start watching yourself, that um, there's an awful lot you can learn from that. And also that indeed someone like Dawkins might be value smuggling because he's not watching himself closely enough. And that's what I think Peterson's impact indeed has been is that um, through, I suppose, if you think about Kierkegaard's leap of faith, and this is a leap of faith that we need to take, it's an irrational leap of faith towards belief because otherwise, you know, you'll just stay in this meaningless dread. Um, and that's, I think, how most young people see Christianity. Like, it's this, it's this huge leap and I don't want to take the leap because I just don't have the faith to get there. And then I think when you really pay close attention to what someone like Peterson is saying, you're noticing that he's taking much less, if any, of a leap in comparison to someone like Dawkins and also in comparison to most pastors. Um, I'm not trying to obviously uh, uh, do um, make the assumption that, that what you're doing is not meaningful because it very much is the case, but I'm trying to understand why someone like Peterson has 2 million subscribers and why it, it's that large of an audience. So in a, in a way, I think that he has um, in a, I still don't really know how, but he has um, minimized this leap of faith to an extent that, um, first of all, most Christians, but also most new atheists just aren't able to do. They still take a leap of faith, and that's the leap of faith where he's value smuggling in, like uh, Joe pointed out. So that's something that we could also discuss. Well, I, I think you're right. I think I think you're. I think that's well said in that he minimized the leap of faith because he's. He's constructing sort of a, and I don't mean again this in a pejorative sense, sort of a Tower of Babel. He's he's trying to build himself up, and okay, he has the idea of God, and he's he's pretty sure that the idea of God is necessary for our functioning and for the creation of our civilization. Um, but what beyond that? And but then, do you need something beyond that? So there's a guy in the comment section named Carl who has been on a bunch of the other channels. I haven't. I should talk. I should. I should run, you know, I should track Carl down and have a conversation with him directly. But he keeps making the point that, you know, all this stuff that Vander Clay talks about, he's, he's right in that it's, it's sort of a, you know, Esther keeps reminding, that's not really natural theology. Okay. But it's sort of a natural theology that sort of builds its way up to God. And yeah, yeah, not, not a big leap of faith required, but, and this is very Petersonian too, mm. every day that we live, we make decisions. And those decisions are based on things. And as Job quite nicely said, a lot of those things that those decisions are based on, we've paid almost zero attention to. We've simply inherited them. We're simply acting out of them. In fact, most of our actions in that case are anything but rational. If we imagine rationality is this line of intentionality by which we project outcomes from certain causes and guide that process. So... We, we, we don't live terribly um, conscious lives. And, you know, I, I, think, I think both of you said quite well to, and, and, and C.S. Lewis basically said this too. C.S. Lewis basically said, you know, if you want to be an atheist, you'd better be very careful about the books that you read. 
And I think if you want to be an atheist, you'd be, you better be very careful about how much you pay attention to and what you pay attention to, because you're very quickly going to you're very quickly going to figure out that a whole bunch of these nice little easy answers that you seem to to have, which defeat all of these religious things out there, are really no different from the nice little easy answers that a whole bunch of religious people have to dismiss mm -hmm. your worldview. And if you actually wade into this stuff and start dealing with it, well, th your life is going to get quite a bit more complicated. Yeah. And but in a good way, hmm. exactly. Paul, Paul, if I may say something to that, yes. Um, the uh, I really like the idea of this world of things and the world of being, because I think I actually share with all these athe atheists the world of things. I, I I love science. I really I don't I don't see any problem in um, researching anything under the sun. I mean it's 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 beautiful. I love it, and I. I don't, I don't have a problem because this is the way that we work. We find out what is, uh, what is probable, and, um, and, and that, I love that. Now, in the world of being, of course, a whole different discussion goes on, and, and I think that then the question becomes, what is the toolkit that you have to make that world of being? Uh, if Harari is talking about intersubjective realities that we are sharing, what are effective intersubjective realities? Let alone the question of things. Uh, I mean, really, just about. So, so we have this, 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 this need now, as, as, as people on this planet, to share stories and visions that 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 connect us. Otherwise, we will not survive. With too many of us, so we need to do a lot with more, with a lot less resources. And I think we can. I mean, I'm working with economists now, and this story is beautiful. And the, and the Christian story, like many other stories, is a very powerful story to to share. And that's all about being. Now, the only thing that is perhaps the leap of faith that I'm still making is that somehow God is part of my intersubjective reality, that I share it also with something like uh, Holy Spirit. But apart from that, um, I'm talking about one of the best toolkits, one of the best set of stories that helps us to, to really move to a world that we um, that we that we are that we know how we can balance loving yourself, loving the other, and loving the whole whatever god is as as father of everyone uh, and I, I think that toolkit is amazing so i think we should share this even if we can't claim anymore on so-called scientific grounds that it is the absolute truth i still think it's mightily effective comforting helpful and i'm i'm happy to to learn from every other worldview but a worldview that says but there is nothing that helps us in being that's just a poorer worldview because i already share the world of things with them you know what I, where i come from so so i'd like to learn from people how they uh, inspire themselves and others and if uh, what you call new atheists uh, would do that i would happily learn from them as well and I came to, you know, when it, and Aaron, I really appreciate you sharing your story and, and Boss, you sharing your story too. And of course, I, I always love it when Job shares, shares his story uh, because, you know, all of us, most of us who, who, are, who are able to talk about these things are able to talk about them because we've dealt with these questions ourselves. Maybe not well, maybe not as exhaustively as others. No one, you know, how to make these comparisons doesn't really doesn't really matter or work, but I, I came to a very similar point that I looked at, I looked at the perspective of the new atheists and I thought, okay, what do I gain by picking this up? What, what do I gain by trying to stop talking to God? Um, even if, even if that is, it is completely fictitious, it sure works for me. So there's, if, if there is no God, then I'm not offending any God by talking to the one I was raised with. So, you know, tell, tell me, get, oh, you know, what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have higher status in your eyes? It's like, I don't, I don't give a rip. <laughs> and, and so, and, and, yeah. So people, people have to think these things through. And, you know, Boss, you started, certainly it is the, it is the longing of every parent who has faith that their child will share their faith. And that will be true of, you know, Christianity, of Islam, of, of many different things. 
but one of the things that one of the things that I you know I I also believe and via my my Dutch Calvinism is that is as good of a witness as I can be, and I'm often not a great one. Um, faith is faith is the product of of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity, and so the Holy Spirit is no less sovereign or involved in this world than any of the other members of the Trinity. And so, finally, with all of these things, I have and know someone to trust the world with. Yes. That is such a powerful thing emotionally mm -hmm. to live with in this world. And I, I look at these atheists and I think, oh, okay. I I I just like like just like you, boss, I I I I pity them because I was just reading today I was just in audiobook actually reading Tom Tom Holland's Dominion and he, mm. he tells the story of a of a martyr who is being killed in a, in, a, in a particular Roman persecution, and she's a slave. And her, her mistress, who is also a Christian, so they're all poured into the arena, and you know, for the sport of the public, they are tortured all in these different ways. And this one slave girl whose name is remembered, her mistress, her name isn't remembered. Many of the other high-status people in town, their name isn't remembered. But the one slave who, it didn't matter what her torturers did to her, she would not renounce. And the way people understood that was that she was formed with this thing called faith. And now suddenly, these propositional elements like the Apostles' Creed come in. Because when, when someone is perhaps, you know, sticking you with a burning coal or, or beginning to flay your flesh and asking you, what kinds of, what kinds of things do they ask you about? Do they say, did you, did you tweet um, transphobic things five years ago? Um, no, they want to know, do you believe in God? Do you, you know, do you, do you say that Jesus is God? And so what this little slave girl, or older woman who was a slave, you know, all of her years of slavery likely taught her a certain degree of toughness and mental discipline that her master never possessed. And so by virtue of her being able to maintain a creed like the Apostles' Creed, she did something that a whole Colosseum who came there to enjoy her humiliation, like what we do on these little internet debates, suddenly had a pause to think and reflect and say, here's a slave woman who had very little value in the eyes of this world. But now in the midst of torture, she exhibited something that put all of us to shame. Hmm, how am I living my life? And of course, that happened thousands of different ways over the Roman Empire until many, many people in the empire decided to imitate her, even though they weren't necessarily being tortured to death. So, you know, yeah, if if you want to remain an atheist, you're really going to have to stick to some pretty narrow places and not see too much of life in some ways. That's a certain kind of atheist. Other atheists, uh, that... I'd like to I'd like to be a bit more positive, if I may. Oh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> I see, think most... my Dutch Calvinism left in the end of the 19th century, so it was a pretty dour time. It got preserved in immigration. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually true what you say there. <laughs> it is. I mean, in general, the Christian Reformed Church in America are a bit more conservative than uh, than the Evangelische in, in Germany or the Dutch Calvinists in, uh, in in the Netherlands. Although we have quite a few old-fashioned ones as well. But no, no, I, I'd like to be a bit more positive because what I find when I when I talk to people who um, uh, think they are atheists. They are nevertheless, because faith for me is not the opposite of science. It's, a, it's of course, living in a trusting relationship. That, that is the biblical word for faith. And um, a trusting relationship, that's what you need. Otherwise, you won't survive with social animals. So if you don't have trusting relationships, you're not going to make it out this in this world. So, and actually, they live this way because they are, they are humans. So they live a life full of faith, even if they would would, would uh, fear to use that word. And if they stand amazed in nature, or if they stand amazed with their little baby in their arms, or if they, if, if they stand in awe 
when, when a friend forgives them. All that is faith. And I'm not saying that that is any less real than what we have. The only thing I'm saying is we have a, um, a, a, a huge set of narratives and stories, both in the Bible and, 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 and this, this slave girl that you're talking about, spanning centuries, spanning continents. So you're part of a huge story. You're part of a, such a great number of voices that you can relate to, that you can actually give words to these experiences that we share with all these atheists, Muslims, or what have you. So I'm, I'm far more positive about the, 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 how they deal with their lives, uh, what kind, and, and I love to learn from them. And, and once we start exchanging on an honest basis, they'll find out that the words that we are using are pretty effective as well. And perhaps give some wisdom of the ages with it and, and then make them understand the art that they live in and the institutions that they're part of. I mean, this, this, this whole society has not been built on nothing. That's, I think, Tom Holland's uh, point as well. Yeah. Uh, the, the, what we live today, the fact that we cherish the weak one, the fact that mm -hmm. we think that, that, that humans are dignified persons and even animals deserve a place under the sun. I mean, all of that is beautifully articulated in... Uh, in Genesis, in the letters of Paul, in the way that Jesus goes about. And, and that has had a huge impact on our culture. So I think you're just more in tune. And, and I do respect that you have to make that heritage into something new as you go into new generations. And some people will call that atheism and others will renew the church. That's fine, as long as you don't dismiss it. Because then you're throwing away all the goodies that we have. Am I now preaching? No, that's no, no. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's very relevant to a, a discussion I had with my atheist friend nowadays. I, I don't, he, he really enjoys having these conversations with me <laughs> while at the same time being really atheist. So I'm trying to figure out what, where that's coming from. But he, he, he doesn't understand where I'm coming from. He doesn't understand why, why I believe in God. And I keep telling him, I don't know either. It wasn't supposed to happen. I'm, I'm just as confused as you are. <laughs> but uh, I try to explain where I come from to him, which is basically the greatest commandment from Matthew, mm -hmm. combined with uh, John twelve fifteen. Anyway, love the other as I loved you, um, which is basically what I take as the core of what I think I should aim for. And I, I, I combine that with the slave morality, which I see as, as a good thing and... Uh, uh, the, the sacrifice of the other, and why am I a firefighter, all that stuff. And he says, okay, you write that down really great, but you don't need God for that. And I'm thinking, fair enough, but I need to ground it in something. And I, I, I've only been able to properly ground this in the absolute, which, which I call God. And he says, yeah, but you don't need to do that. You can just live like that without God. And so that makes me think, well, what's this problem with God? Is that some sort of judgment thing or, or hell thing? I mean, he has, he has like a 30 years of evangelical background with bad experiences. So he comes from a different, like we're, we're ships passing in the in, in <laughs> sea. <laughs> You're going uh, a different one. I know, I know. And, and so... You know, I appreciate that he takes me to Dawkins. <laughs> 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 but, I mean, that is interesting because, uh, to be honest, I don't have a good answer. I just find it easy to, like, okay, you know, I'm just, like, I just woke up and figured, well, it seems I'm not an atheist anymore. Like, that was more a thing I realized than anything else. Like, when I now think of God, I mean, it sounds bizarre, but it seems like, well, there seems to be something there that's real. I don't know what that means or if I'm making that up, but it's easier than saying, well, I act as if, which is really weird because act as if was easier first. Hmm. So, but, but to be honest, I don't have an answer to the question of, well, you don't need God to live a moral life. I, I, I don't think that's, that's wrong per se. I don't think you need God to live a moral life, but then you need to ask yourself where that morality comes from. And why, why is it why it is better than another morality, if if those are per definition subjective? Now that's maybe a whole different discussion. And well, it's a good one. I I 
see, Joe, part of, so I, you know, my father, my father lived a very sacrificial life in that I watched him spend, you know, people will sometimes, oh, Paul, you're so smart. You've read all that. I, my, my father was just as smart as I am, if not more, just as well read as I am, if not more. He spent his whole life working in, working in churches, uh, small churches. He never had a YouTube channel. You know, in the denomination, people knew him and respected him. But his first 36 years he spent in Patterson, New Jersey, moving people's refrigerators and stoves, uh, bringing them food, preaching sermons, doing funerals for people. You know, if the funeral director got a body from the city and had to go to Potter's Field, you know, Stan will say a few words and so call Stan. And so here's a guy who lives his whole life doing this, never making much money. And it's like, why? Why do that? Why sacrifice yourself for people that this world will never know or value? And this is where God comes in, in a big way, because the frame in which we live right now is, the, the, the implicit assumption is you have between zero and 80 to live your best life now. And your best life now is, is seen as, well, have as much enjoyment, have as much gratification, do all of these things and fill that up. Now, you might say, well, I'm a firefighter because it's meaningful to me. And, you know, long before Jordan Peterson came along, it could be that your service as a firefighter was a gateway drug to all of this because you've developed in yourself a sense of meaning. But it gets to some point when how do you sustain sacrifice, even if it's meaningful, in a, in a way that this world says is irresponsible? And I always come to the resurrection and the life of the age to come that says to me, I can pour myself out for my neighbor in this world. And, you know, it's, 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 it's very responsible. And, and why? Well, look at Jesus. The, the, the stories of Jesus are crazy if imagined within our present frame. Because he's, he lives 33 years. He has three years of public ministry. Well, that seems a waste. Um, and in the three years of public ministry, he tells his disciples, I'm going down to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be betrayed, turn over to Gentiles, and they're going to crucify me. And Peter says, that's crazy talk. And if I'm just working on a passage this week where, where Jesus says, you know, you know, if you want to save your life, your suke, your soul, that, that, that thing that you think is you, if you want to save that thing, you're going to lose it. You need to take up your cross and follow me, and then you'll find it. That's nuts. And he says, anybody who doesn't do this, when I come, when the Son of Man comes with his angels, I'll be ashamed of him. It's like, boy, you know, Richard Dawkins is going to read that thing and say, that's nuts. But actually, it's that kind of living that leads people to get a terribly expensive metal degree, medical degree in North America and then go and serve Africans for their whole life long. And if that kind, if that's crazy, that's a beautiful kind of crazy, and I want the whole world to live it. So <laughs> that's why, you know, I, I, God and morality are definitely connected, and we can kind of do things in short bursts. But boy, for me, it's a lot easier if I've got the resurrection and the life of the age to come behind me to give myself to people who probably don't deserve it. <laughs> yeah, but also it's a lot easier to love somebody, let's say, out of the Christian ethic, when you have a full belly and a good night of sleep. Oh, yeah. Fair and enough. Oh, we, we can just live like this without God. Really? You're going to do that when, when, well, let's say your life is suboptimal and, you know, somebody pisses you off on the road. Really, you're going to forgive them with with without any anything outside of you that makes this life greater than just you and your wants and needs it, it it's not going to hold in my work for a little bit i should write a sermon about this <laughs> job is the pastor of the discord as i've been told well, the, the, you've got something there i mean you call yourself uh, paul a, uh, um, a pastor of a small church but if you've got ten thousand followers 
it's not Joel Osteen yet, but I mean, it's a big church <laughs> that you're ministering to. <laughs> you two yeah, with, with, with the three piece is a suit. thing. <laughs> and he pulling his suit and a tie. <laughs> You're known as the pastor of the IDW as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Look at my mm. congregation. Yeah. I got a dude that says he believes, he acts as if God is real. I've got some celebrity atheists, and uh, I've got a, I've got a, um, the, the only, the only one who goes to any kind of religious organization with any kind of consistency um, isn't a Christian and makes uh, culture war videos on YouTube for a conservative audience. There's my flock. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but Paul, let's be honest now. Isn't that not the, the, the new type of flock that we're talking about? Are we not supposed to be there? Yes. For everyone? Yes. And can we say, well, you're not just a Christian when you go into church, sit in a pew every Sunday and um, read the Bible every day and, and say, say your prayer, prayers. Um, basically, we're all concerned about how to be more loving in this world, how what Favek is saying, agape as a mode of being, how to practice that in the world. And if you are having difficulty in this day and age to um, accept certain creedal confessions or to do certain religious things, but you are all committed to, to, to embrace agape as a mode of being, aren't you following Jesus? I mean, that's that, his commandment. that question of definition is 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 real. I'm working really hard on that. I haven't made a lot of videos, but I think that in many ways is so much of what we're wrestling with now, mm. which is you know. So Tom Holland comes along and says, "All you people in the West and your values, you know, everybody outside the West looks at that and says, yeah, that's Christian.' In the West, oh, I'm not a Christian. You know, how dare you call me a Christian?" Um, and Tom Holland has a point, but mm -hmm. the, you know, Kanye West also has a point where he says, you know, you know, <laughs> where, where he, he recognizes that in many ways for, I, I love the Kanye West story because kingdom, the American kingdom came for Kanye West. He's got all of this money. He's got all of this fame. He's got a beautiful wife. He's got, you know, he had a period, he could have sex with anybody he wanted to, was going to marry a porn star. You know, he had the life Donald Trump wanted. Um, <laughs> and, and he gets to a point and he says, gosh, what, 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 what have I, I, I've gained the whole world, yet I don't have my soul. How, how can I have my soul? And then he, I'm convinced a lot of what he's doing is for his daughter because mm -hmm. he's now seeing himself through different <clears throat> eyes now as a father instead yeah. of just a freelancer. And he wants, he wants his daughter to experience some of what he knows. And so he's off on this crazy tear now, flying a gospel choir around. But, but this, what Kanye and Jordan have been working through is very much they are, in a sense, doing theology with us and for us. And my complaint is the church, does, had, the church has no idea how to engage in this conversation. And yeah. that's, I think God will judge us for that. Yeah, and the problem that uh, Jonathan Pajot also raised is that he does think this is a very uh, beautiful development, but he... Uh, isn't sure how it all stacks up in the end. So how do those families eventually start living together, even if we're increasing uh, and improving our lives as individuals? And that's something for the church also to figure out. Yeah. Well, that's one thing. I think we, we talked about that uh, when we met in Utrecht. Huh? Um, there are different styles of being in a relationship to something that you can call God. Um, we've, we've talked about the extrinsic style that you, you see God as some, something of some, someone who has demands of you, who is a king mm -hmm. uh, or a judge, um, a more relational type of God, and a more uh, questing type of people who have a more, say, conceptualized God. And somehow we feel that, um, that, that we're jealous of having this relational type of God, which also, by the way, psychology of religion um, says is the most healthy type, the one that gives you the most support in your life. 
But somehow, because we're now these questers, because we have all these doubts, it's difficult to embrace that family type of God, which would also make us more family. So I'm, I'm a bit worried. Um, uh, I'm very happy that we're moving away from this judgmental type of faith. I think Jesus moved us away from that. I think Paul definitely um, um, made a huge switch from one side to the other there. But now many of us are these questers. And, and, and we still talk about God as something that we need to prove or not prove. Whereas the relationship is what really helps you get old and, 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 and let go of your life and see how things move on even if you're no longer in control. This is what I also like in um, John Pervecki's approach, even though he is not doing it from a Christian perspective, but he is looking into the notion and concept of dialogue and discussion, not as a debate that some like mm -hmm. one of two people ought to win, but really as something that in which both parties can gain insight. So even though John is not a Christian, that element like just adds up to that broader Christian mission that we're all engaging in right now. And that's, yeah, that, that is useful, I think. Well, and, and, and John, so John made a video with Jordan Greenhall and Peugeot commented <laughs> on it. I, in, in Toronto in September for a church, Urban Abbey, the three of us are invited for a conference. That'll be fun because, I mean, and, and I, I, you know, Peugeot, they're both sort of at the extremes. I mean, Peugeot went all the way down to the most changeless form of Christianity that we have on the planet, which is orthodoxy. I mean, they're, they're still using the liturgy from, yeah. what, the fourth or fifth century? So... He goes, he goes all the way there to find his roots. And Verveke is trying to, you know, trying to build a religion that isn't religion based on cognitive science and philosophy. And it's like, oh, uh, that's ambitious. Um, <laughs> as, a, as a pastor who deals in religion all the time, just to, just to have people buy a religion that they say they already believe and in, integrate it into their lives, I find that challenging enough But <laughs> to build a whole new one. Wow. So, but that's really where we're at in a lot of ways. And I love the way Peugeot frames a lot of these inversions that we, we've got to a point where uh, Akira the Don made the comment once that, you know, so Madonna takes off her clothes and how much more naked can Madonna get? Um, and so now suddenly radicalism is Kanye telling his wife, I wish you'd dress a little bit more modestly. And, <laughs> you know, Kardashian being like, I don't quite know how to respond to that. Didn't you love me because I'm all of that? And now you want to change me? And you're a man, Amy, on and on and on and on. So... No, we're, we're in this space now where, but yeah, I had a conversation yesterday with Warren Mills, who's a guy I know from Australia. I'll probably post that tomorrow where, you know, and Warren was we're talking about church scandals. And I, I told him, I think, I think gospel plus people will always gravitate towards church because we can't do this alone. You know, even Job, your atheist friend, you know, you're going this way, and he brings you to the Dawkin event. That you're 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 both working this stuff out. And if he wants his, if he wants to stay secure in his atheism, he should probably stay away from you. <laughs> well, uh, look, two years ago I was in the same place, so I, I'm very very careful to to assume I know things. Uh, I think. I don't know, I'm just rambling. What, what Peterson did, which was, what, what he says is, you're here, you could be there, and you know this, but you're not listening to it. And then you blame your resentment on, of, of yourself on other things, because it's some sort of strange defense mechanism. And I, I and and for, and then then he connects it to some old story. At least that's how it worked for me. And like, wait, that's it, that story. Just like how you both said, wait, there's Socratic dialogue in Moses and God. 
and I, I think that's, that's the, that's the bait. Hmm. The bait is to show that you're already doing religious things or are aware of these things. And you're sometimes aiming towards me. You know that that feels good, but you're, you're, for lack of a better word, you're too weak to consistently do that. And then Peterson says, but you, you, you must, you must carry that cross up that hill to that city on the mountain, bucko. And I think from there, once you start paying attention to yourself, because you start to do that, I have no proof of this. I'm just analyzing myself. Then from there, you start to look at, well, what else am I not really paying attention to? And I think that could connect to what you're saying, boss, in, well, that's kind of the quest God, hmm. the, the quest to get up the hill. But from there, once you start going, you, you might run into this father figure God who's trying to help you get up the hill. That's, that's it, huh? What you're saying there. It's, it's the difference between a God that is a, in the end, a proposition, or something that strengthens you and the people with you to move to towards this whatever vision of a better place you have. Right. I mean, and it's not like the, the judgmental God might not be there, but it's not judgmental in the sense that, you know, let's say Calvinist, like you worthless sinner, you, you, you wretched thing that breathes. It's more like that is the judgment in the sense that, well, but you, you're not that which you could be. Let's get you there. And that's also the quest, but then there you kind of combine them into, well, the quest is to be what you could be because, well, shit, I'm uh, losing the, the big picture. Uh, you're getting help to get there because of that relationship with God who uses judgment to tell you where you should, I don't know, burn off the dead wood. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Truth embedded in love. That's essentially what you're talking about. Right. Where's that come? Where, where's that from, Aaron? <laughs> well, so that's something that we discussed, I think, on Saturday. That uh, uh, we were forgive unsure. me for not remembering. That's okay. You had four hours of sleep, so that makes sense. <laughs> but uh, we discussed uh, how much uh, uh, a force like Peterson is a force towards the responsible side of faith, like get your shit together, um, and how much he's also pulling in love one another and. And, and we weren't sure if he was as, as strong on the love side. But then we do know that he does discuss this idea of sort of embedding this truth value in love. But we were unsure if that's something that he had. And that's maybe something for the church to then figure out, which is actually yeah, yeah. in those communities. Is it coming back that's, to you? My, yeah, my pastor's been telling me similar things. Mm. Like, like Peterson is way down under the, the, the weight of being and the responsibility of always making the right choice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I used to have that view because of Peterson, and somebody said, oh, you're one of those rough wooden cross type people, <laughs> <laughs> the, the <laughs> suffering under the, the weight of existence. Yeah. But my pastor says, but that's, that's not the point. The cross becomes light once you're aiming towards, towards God. Mm. Because that, that, it's not like picking up the cross. It's, you know, my burden is, is easy and my yoke is light. Yeah, that's exactly, I wanted to point that out, that Christ also says that explicitly, like, I will share it. And, will, and then I've, and that, that also brings back that notion that he has done the work for us. And that's also why, to relate it back to Kanye West, as soon as he becomes a father, he's like, I have to take care of this child yes. now. How do I do that? Oh, I realize someone has been taking care of me. So actually... That's, that gives me the motivation to also take care of her and take care of all these people in my crowd. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that you say that, Adam, because this is um, the biggest miracle that, that I ever experienced was becoming a father and standing there with that little baby in your arms. I mean, we were in South Africa in Johannesburg, Joburg, and she was born there after a horrendous long period and, and a home delivery because we Dutch like home deliveries. So we thought we could do that in South Africa as well. And I found out there were two midwives for the whole of Johannesburg actually doing that kind of stuff. So, so, so that, that went on and we were completely exhausted. And then, and then I was uh, walking across the hill uh, towards the print shop where we would get our birth announcements. And I was like really 
looking at everybody around me like, hey, you all have father and mother or you have kids. Um, and I finally said, well, if, if this love exists, I didn't know it existed. I mean, that you can love unconditionally without yet getting anything back. It's, it's difficult for you to imagine, Aaron, but, but once I loved you in that way. all these atheist questions at you yeah no i get it <laughs> no but i really felt that understanding god or the concept of god as a father really changed once that happened i mean i, I it's 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 unfair to say to people because not everybody becomes a dad or a mom so it's it's unfair to to say that's a requirement but for me it changed it, it, it changed my whole perspective on uh, addressing God as a father and what that means. Yes. And this There's is something that, that I think perspectival knowing. Mm. And, I, and that perspectival knowing, if you turn that around into the Apostles' Creed, now suddenly that word father in the Apostles' Creed, um, you've now, in a sense, seen it from on top. Mm. And having seen it from on top, you know it from the bottom. And, you know, it's, it's amazing in, in one of my talks, in one of my talks with Nathan Jacobs talking about the Trinity, you know, father, son, Jesus, you know, when Jesus, you know, it's implicit and maybe Hosea, you know, you mm -hmm. know, Ephraim, Ephraim, but Jesus brings it full into life. What a daring move because you know, that, that's, that's just so audacious. You know, Islam won't say that, um, no. that, that God is our father. And all that then gets built into that with each of us for good and for bad. Um, but right there, right there, experientially. Now, suddenly, because that you're embedded in that story, like you said so well, this becomes alive. Yeah. yeah. I was also, that's something that I... Uh, think that Verveke might also be missing right now, even though I am really interested in how he's going to end uh, the series of his. But at the same time, um, there is this, I don't know, he's missing the notion of being a child to a father and therefore taking care of other people. I was at, um, someone once gave a lecture on um, sort of comparing Nietzsche to um, uh, uh, a French uh, brother at Taze, we have this uh, community there. Um, and he said that they were both very interested in this sort of becoming of the child. So Nietzsche has an entire metamorphosis of becoming the camel, then becoming the lion, and then becoming the child to then be born again. But he pointed out that the difference is that Nietzsche never knew whose child he was then going to be. So he is implying this relational aspect by saying, I, w I want to become a child at the end of the metamorphosis. But there is no relation there because there is no father. And this is also what Peterson has been pointing out. is like there are, there's no way to embed these values in, in such a way because you can't relate it to anything else. And this is something that I'll be interested to see how Fervecki is going to sort of integrate this into his series. But we'll see. It's interesting that you call Fervecki here, uh, that you, you talk about Fervecki here, because I, I watched his... Um, uh, video with Jordan Hall is is it Jordan Hall is his name that the and they were talking about their project, mm -hmm. and I thought this is not that much different from what Paul was doing except for this father thing, mm -hmm. because Paul was really making a new family uh, for meaning for people who were uh, neither Jew, nor Greek, nor Roman, nor whatever. And it was at a time that Christianity didn't exist as a name. So he was really arguing why people who were coming from different backgrounds with different identities could nevertheless form a family in which took care of each other and which found meaning somewhere. Of course, in the perspective of Jesus. So we now say that's Christian because if you, yeah, if you follow Jesus, then, then you're a Christian. But at that time, that word had no currency, not, not at all. And, 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 and the fun thing is, um, what was defined as religion was really the worship of the gods according to certain laws. And Paul ex makes that explode because he says, I'm no longer interested in religion as a set of laws. He says that they, those were given by angels. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the real stuff here, guys. 
So, so what, what is forever and what is really important, and then he talks about that we cry out to, to be adopted as children of the Father. So adoption is, is the real thing. It's, it's wonderful. Hey, guys. We've got a new one. I'll, I'll, I'll see you in uh, about uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> He's like, what? what? It's the same <laughs> link for the room, and I'm doing a previous conversation. He might not be able nice. to hear us. Nice to meet you. <laughs> we'll leave him okay. there until he figures out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> one big happy family. <laughs> I, I haven't, I haven't, I, I have a new system for my links. Oh, well, well, uh, he'll come back. Don't worry. There we go. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Hope a little, bit okay. of, little bit of administrative yeah. power. Um, mm. <laughs> Design no, intervention. You know, and, and Verveke's project is, is so interesting to me because, oh, yeah, you know, comparing he, him and Peterson has been has been fascinating in a lot of different levels because in many ways Peterson Peterson is has been so stoic and Verveke, um James K. A. Smith, who's a philosopher at Calvin College, just recently did a video with Rebel Wisdom mm. and did a little bit of critique. I don't think I don't think Smith is following much of this at all. He's got his own stuff that he's running, but. The, one of the points that he made, which I think was a very good point, was that in our frame, and this is very true of Verveke and Jordan Hall, all of this are things we need to do, okay? We need to engage in these practices. We need to build these communities. This is all very, this is all a product of our intentionality and our agency and dependent upon our actions in a certain vein. And that is that is very telling the uh peter bogosian i have to get back to peter bogosian the publisher sent me a, a copy of his book that he just released and i should do a conversation how to have impossible conversations because of course peter bogosian got himself into a whole bunch of hot water over some things but again his all of that is so driven by intentionality that mm. this is something he needs to do what what paul has to leverage is this is is Judaism, which at that point in the Roman Empire, people were getting very interested in Judaism. There were all these God fearers, you know, that Paul bumps into in the Book of Acts, and of course, these are the women. They just they can just join the synagogue, no problem. But the men, you know, there's blood in the game there, boys, and uh, so they're uncircumcised, and 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 Paul comes along, but he's able to leverage this entire context this entire perspectival knowing and and the the difficulty that i think and john will probably watch this video so the difficulty that john faces is whereas every would-be developer of a religion must engage the assumed perspectival landscape in which they engage paul already had the Pentateuch and the Hebrew scriptures and this entire world. And one of the things that I learned doing meetups here is that the group that we started doing meetups here became a core. And once you have a culture, that culture can grow. Yeah. And so Paul could leverage all of that stuff in the Roman empire. And it was a huge advantage in terms of, in terms of creating a world. Yeah, and there was existing capital. That's right. That's right. Something. That's right. Instead of having to make it all up yourself, and you know, hey, Mormons did that too. Um, you know, Islam did that. It's very difficult to to start from scratch. And but but you can argue that Mormons and Islam both worked on the framework of Christianity, or in the case of Islam, for Christianity and Judaism, um, and quite effectively so. I mean, they they worked on some. They 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 preserved some of their capital. If you were good. In Christianity or Judaism, you had a, a real good head start in Islam yep. or in Mormonism. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Rodney Stark, of course, writes a lot about this stuff. Uh, yep. Right of Christianity, or a think about all the the ways that you can apply the economics to uh, <laughs> to these uh, growth of uh, of new religions. Uh, and I think it would do well for 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 Vivek if he wants to do this project. 
to actually read up on that stuff. Yeah. Because it shows some of the dynamics of what's going on. And, and it's always an exponential growth that looks small at the start. But if it's a steady percentage increase, of course, it's never steady, but for modeling purposes, then, then it, 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 it seems to take off at some point in time. But this is also where you get back to God, because evangelicals, my God number one and God number two, evangelicals, God number one kind of shrank. And so God number two expanded. But, mm. you know, sort of Jordan Peterson's Darwinian perspective, the, the best story wins. The truest story mm -hmm. wins. Mm -hmm. And, you know, winners and losers. Um, over time, to actually start a religion, it, it's going to live far beyond you. It's nothing that any one individual can control. And in fact, in our perspective, any marketer who is trying to promote something like this already has a liability. We can ask science. We can talk about Scientology. Um, <laughs> so, I've got I've got about another another five minutes, and I should probably um, then I'm going to take a little break, and then I'll talk to that poor guy who came into our room. <laughs> he's that's going to be an interesting conversation too. He's from Yale, and he's got a bunch of things about Connecticut history that he wants to talk about with respect to the meeting crisis. So kind of anxious to hear what he's gonna have to say about that it should be fun nice and and that's that's where that's where this channel for me has just been just a tremendous amount of fun all <laughs> interesting people like you guys now find me and we can have these talks so this is great yeah so, thank you very much for offering mm. the platform this is amazing i think well any 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 summaries you all want to do any takeaways from this conversation just what have we talked about and what, what do you take away from it? Uh, Dad, you go first. I need to think about this for a sec. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'm still in flow, so I'm still learning and it's, um, it's, it's sufficiently uh, known area to, to learn, but it's sufficiently unknown to, to, to really make it exciting and, and be part of it. So I thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm behind you guys, so I'm now halfway for Vakey's series. Uh, I've done the Peterson lectures, so that's, that's pretty good. So Maps of Meaning, Psychology Course, and, 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 and the uh, Biblical Interpretation. But I think it's really exciting that, that people are now working together. And I think, um, John, for Vakey actually credited you, Paul, also with your project of doing the same stuff he is doing for an entirely new religion. <laughs> But, but, but we're getting back to something that means something for people. And I, and I think that's wonderful. And, and, and yeah, well, if we can be um, in conversation like, 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 like this is happening, I mean, that's, that's a real blessing in the real sense of the word. So, yeah, thank you for that. So if you start a YouTube channel, is it going to be in Dutch or English? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, Hebrew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Should be. <laughs> no, but the fun thing is, of course, the, um, the, the, the language of your heart is important if you, if you really want to touch people. That's right. Um, but young people now, especially at the universities, uh, do speak a lot of English. So I, I guess some of the concepts that we're discussing now, Aaron is more comfortable discussing in English than he is in Dutch. Is that true, Aaron? Sadly so, yes, but uh, it is true, yeah. Yeah. So so what's the so, yeah, future so of the Dutch language? If we do something, we have to do it. We have, no, the, the Dutch language will survive. It's pretty big. Um, <laughs> but we just have to, well, no, no it will survive. Don't, don't worry about that. But the, um, <laughs> for, for a time, I mean, <laughs> the, the, Brexit, the Brexit opens up new possibilities, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Dutch, always ready for a new possibility. There's opportunity here. <laughs> <laughs> we can do business. <laughs> <laughs> well, huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's rotten because they are one of our bigger traders, biggest trading partners. But, uh, but apart from that, yeah, there are huge opportunities. No, but it will be fun. And I think uh, uh, if we do something, I need to be coached by Aaron because I can't do this. And I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that you managed, uh, Paul. <laughs> I, I stumbled in. It was a complete accident. It's like Job's conversion. Yeah. I didn't intend to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, pro I'm probably the only one who was supposed to be here. Like all <laughs> <That's of you> <laughs> <just> <laughs> <cancel>. <laughs> 
I wasn't even supposed to be in this call. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. couldn't stay away. <laughs> no, nope. uh, I, 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 I'm really interested to, to, to in the progress of how your book will, uh, will, will form. I think that's going to be very interesting. And, and I, I would love if we could reach, I just spent some time on a subreddit that is about antinatalism. Some sort of, out of a sort of morbid curiosity, and it can be it, it's mostly just cynicism and despair mm. and those are things that are new that's not new in society that what that goes all the way back to the Roman times. I mean, if you look at Diogenes, the Greek, he was pretty cynical <laughs> and about despair, and he couldn't find an honest man, and hopefully we can. No, reach them with, with the right axiom poking, which hopefully your book will be able to do. Thank you. Wow. All right, Aaron, you got the last word. Well, uh, I've noticed that even though philosophically I'd like to describe myself as an agnostic, I just simply can't exclude <laughs> God from my worldview anymore, thanks to you guys. Um, and yeah, effectively... I suppose we have to do like what uh, Douglas Murray referred to as Jesus smuggling <laughs> in a sense uh, and doing it in a way that um, we would also appreciate it if um, what well, I think like, like, like my father has pointed out, we just appreciate in general the, the conversations and that this may be part of a newer Christian mission when, you know, we don't need to have it all tied as closely to identity. And that's not a discussion that we can have as the point that Pajot raised, but that's something for uh, future discussions, I suppose. But thank you very much for this. I really enjoyed it. Oh, well, thank you guys for, for coming on. And, uh, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what kind of discussion this generates and then we'll take it from there. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. All right. It's, it's evening for you guys. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. uh, 1 a.m., yeah. 1 a.m. <laughs> well, you, you go to bed and have a good sleep. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Have a great Thank day. you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.